Hey, David. Yes. You hear me okay? I can. Um, Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lou Sagar. I'm the, based at the Alchemist Kitchen. I'm the CEO and founder. I'm here with David. Uh, uh, we're going to be speaking about uh, adaptogenics, and we're just going to uh, chat a little bit. You, as pe We're going to give a few minutes, let people uh, come in. So, uh, but welcome. Uh, and uh, we're, we're going to um, leave a lot of time to create some dialogue and some Q&A with everybody. So um, we'll just um, go for a few minutes. But uh, David, did, did the, the uh, early writings of adaptogenics, right? The, the works of, the, was there a period where there was a lot of uh, early you know, books and documents created? Or has it been a kind of a journey of, of you know, cumulative books and, and so forth? Um, before we start, Lou, I just want to let you know, there's about 13 non-video participants. So I think there's a lot of people who are still waiting to get in. So we okay. might want to just wait a few minutes, not too sure. long, because the people yeah. who made the effort to be here on time, we certainly course. don't yeah. want them to, to lose out on okay. any of their time. But we just might want to let the everybody else join in. Yeah, fair enough. Let's see. Because it's only 6.02. And so yeah. what do you say we wait two more minutes? Sure. Because I see we have about 24 participants and you said there was about 46. So yeah, that means we're really well, only about half. What of the happens people. is I, I I usually just start you know yakking away, <laughs> and then officially start you know at about six five you know. Oh okay. But, um, yeah. All right then. It, it, then it, go it, for it. it. Yeah. Uh, get, but no, my my. Uh, I think what um, what's important is that uh, that that uh, for those of you who are are live and, and listening in I'm, I'm I was very impressed to learn uh, since David uh, Winston's coming from his Bucks County home that he has a great collection of uh, medicinal herbal and naturopathic books going back you know centuries so we were we were uh, exchanging some 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 thoughts around collecting and and uh, I, I'm I'm a collector myself, so I was impressed with that. So we were having a little casual. How many people now uh, do we have on? We are at 28. 28. So Roshina, you 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 give me a you give me a um, just a prompt when when everybody comes in. It, it, it's very often these days that it takes a few minutes. People are settling in and. Absolutely, and just a reminder for everybody, um, this will be sent to people as a recording, so sometimes um, people don't show up it, knowing that they will receive the recording, but I think a seven minute grace period is always a really nice time to start, and then just some best practices for a Zoom optimal experience. Um, if you find your internet connection, running a little bit shoddy, um, I suggest uh, Xing out of any program that might unknowingly be absorbing your bandwidth. So this would include Spotify, Google Chrome, Internet Explorer. Sometimes that can really affect the whole call. So it's just a practice that you might want to utilize just in case you find um, too much pause or feedback on the call. And uh, people can uh, post questions along the way, right? We're going to moderate the chat. So if there's something uh, important you notice or like to make an observation or ask a question, perhaps some of you are joining because you know of David's work and uh, may have specific questions. So we'll make every effort to uh, accommodate everybody. All right, Lou, it's 6.05. Why don't, we, why don't we start? Yeah, okay. 
So, uh, David, uh, thank you so much. Uh, for those of you that uh, uh, don't know David Winston's work, uh, he's a really, really, a, 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 a really an elite, in my in my opinion, an elite herbal leader and and guidance counselor to how we, first of all, what our attitude should be when approaching the use of medicinal herbs and plants and and mushrooms in one's lifestyle, you know, and with herbalism becoming so popular, really plant-based health, which at the Alchemist Kitchen, we've had the blessings and the privilege to uh, establish some reputation um, and some humility around the power of plants for the last three years in the heart of New York City. And we've just been through, uh, you know, uh, 14 weeks of uh, shutdowns and we've stayed open every single day at the Alchemist Kitchen to help our local community. We did a lot of support work for the front lines, hospital workers. Uh, we, we, we've had a very unique experience. We're very, we have great gratitude to the fact that people be, were curious and interested in the power of plants and herbal remedies. So the virtual learning was launched. David Winston um, is someone who has been um, very much an influence on our approach, our philosophy um, in, in herbal medicine. And today, um, the focus of the conversation is really around adaptogenic herbs and, and mushrooms. David, uh, they, adaptogenic herbs, also, it can be be with fungi, right? Mushrooms and herbs and plants. There is one mushroom that we know is an adaptogen, and there is a second mushroom that is what I would call a possible adaptogen. So let me just quickly for everybody explain, because one of the issues with the term adaptogen is that, first off, it's a modern term. The term was actually coined in 1969, which is actually the same year I started studying herbal medicine. And so the term is only 51 years old. And so while tonic herbs have been used in traditional Chinese medicine, known as kidney yang tonics or qi tonics, and uh, tonic herbs have been used in Ayurveda, known as rasayanas, the term rasayana or the term kidney yang tonic or chi tonic is not necessarily synonymous with adaptogen. So while they overlap, some rasayanas, some kidney yang tonics are adaptogens, others are not. So the modern term adaptogen has a very specific um, definition. And without going into a great detail, let me just say that in 1969, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Breckman and Dr. Stardenmoff proposed the initial definition of an adaptogen, which was very simple, that an adaptogenic herb had to be relatively non-toxic at normal therapeutic dose. Number two, it created what was called a non-specific state of resistance, meaning it helped you to resist stress regardless of where it was coming from. So it could be environmental stress, uh, emotional stress, chemical stress. It didn't matter the source of the stress it would help you to adapt to it more effectively. And thirdly, they would have a systemic, what would be considered to be amphoteric effect, meaning helping to balance and re-regulate the organism. So that was the initial definition of an adaptogen. The problem is that many, many people are still using that original definition as to what is an adaptogen. And again, that was an initial idea 51 years ago. In the intervening 51 years, there's been tremendous research on adaptogens and studies, and we now know that adaptogens do other things. And so in order for an herb to be an adaptogen, yes, it has to meet those first three parameters, but lots of things that are not adaptogens meet those three parameters. And so now we know, again, I'll keep it really short and simple, but Adaptogens work through two of the major control systems of the body. One's called the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is the interface between your endocrine system, immune system, nervous system, cardiovascular system, uh, the enteric brain in your gut, 
as well as male and female reproductive function. All that's tied together in the HPA axis and something called the SAS, the sympathoadrenal system, which is your fight or flight mechanism. And then on top of that, adaptogens um, basically work also on a cellular level, helping to prevent um, cortisol-induced mitochondrial dysfunction. And the mitochondria are the powerhouses of your cells. And chronic stress causes elevation of a stress hormone called cortisol. And over time, the cortisol actually shuts down the mitochondria, leading to things like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue immune deficiency syndrome. So adaptogens help prevent that. And maybe later I'll talk about more as to how they do that. But they, in sure. order for an herb to be an adaptogen, it has to do all of those things. And so in the new edition of my adaptogens book, what I did is I categorized adaptogens into three categories. We have well-researched adaptogens. There are only nine well-researched adaptogens that we absolutely know are adaptogenic. Okay, that's better. <laughs> that other list looked a little funny. That, and that's the new edition of my adaptogens book, by the way. Um, so um, we have another major book, by the way. Thank you. We have another six herbs that are what I would call probable adaptogens. The research is not quite as good, but strong enough that I, th I think likely they will prove to be adaptogens. And then we have an about another dozen herbs that are what I call possible adaptogens. And the evidence there is not very good at all. So Lou, going back to your original question, yeah. cordyceps, which is the caterpillar fungus, is a well-researched adaptogen. And the only other fungus that I know of that is possibly an adaptogen, and this is a possible adaptogen, so the evidence is pretty poor, is reishi or ling zhe, uh, the Chinese mushroom. Interesting. Okay. And you know, these days you're seeing a lot of interest in mushroom health. So when we talk about adaptogens, uh, I think you, one takeaway today is that then cordyceps is certainly something uh, to really get familiar with um, if you're interested in mushroom health and reishi, of course, and all of the mushrooms uh, offer great stuff. So, uh, so the adaptogens, how does one, uh, why, are they, why are they called regulators? You know, there, there are certain terms, I did a, you know, that, that they regulate. Do, do adaptogenic herbs generally regulate within the body balance and so forth? That, that seems to be something that's asked quite often. Well, the second point that I had made before in the initial definition of adaptogens was that they have, actually the third point that I made was that they have what's called a systemic amphoteric effect. That means they help to normalize function. So if your immune system's overactive, they may help bring it back to normal functioning. If it's underactive, hypoactive, they help enhance its activity. So in general, Adaptogens have a sort of systemic amphoteric effect, um, but that's not across the board. So let me give you an example. Many of our listeners, I am sure, have heard of the mushroom, uh, the, mushroom the herb ashwagandha, which is an Ayurvedic herb. Uh, it's in the nightshade family. And ashwagandha stimulates the thyroid. In fact, it's probably the best herb I know of for stimulating the thyroid. So I use it a lot for people who have things like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is an autoimmune uh, disease of the thyroid causing an underactive thyroid. On the other hand though, ashwagandha is not an amphoteric to the thyroid. So it stimulates the thyroid, but you would not use it in somebody who has Graves' disease which is a hyperactive condition of the thyroid because it can make it worse. So while most adaptogens have a general balancing or amphoteric effect, that doesn't mean that every adaptogen has that effect on every organ or every system in your body. So that's one of the reasons, there's actually two reasons, the book that we had up before, uh, there's two reasons I wrote that book. One was I got tired of people calling herbs adaptogens that are not adaptogens. You know, I've heard people saying, right. oh, yes, uh, cranberries are an adaptogen. No, they're not. Not in the least. Um, <laughs> you know, cannabis is an adaptogen. No, it's not. 
Um, so number one, I got tired of people saying things were adaptogens that aren't adaptogens. They simply don't meet the definition at all. But the other point was, is that I, I used to teach a lot in the UK. I still teach in the UK. I was there two years ago, but I used to be there almost every single year. And um, now I go over every few years. Um, I've been teaching actually a lot more in Ireland these days. Um, love Ireland, love the UK. But anyway, um, when I would teach in the UK, a lot of the schools there would teach herbs and they would give their students like a list and it'd say, well, here's all the adaptogens. Here's all the diuretics, the herbs that increase urine output. Here's all the this, or here all of that. And it's a terrible way of learning herbs because every plant has a personality, all right? And so you need to learn the personality, like every person has a personality. You sit there and say, somebody because they are, are a certain gender or ethnicity or religion is this way, that's a gross mischaracterization that you're not giving any, you know, you have to find out who is the person. So you have to find out who is the plant, who is the herb. And so, adaptogens are not all the same. They're not a one-size-fits-all phenomenon. So we have adaptogens that are stimulating, like Asian ginseng or rhodiola. We have adaptogens that are calming, like ashwagandha or cordyceps or uh, schizandra. We have adaptogens that are warming and heating. We have adaptogens that are cooling. We have adaptogens that are moistening, uh, drying ones. We have nourishing adaptogens. So the key is, if you're going to use adaptogens, you need to learn about them so you can decide which adaptogen or, more likely, which adaptogens plus companion herbs are appropriate for me. Because understand yeah. that here in the United States, we came out of what I call the herbal dark ages. For a long period of time, herbal medicine ceased to exist in the United States. But when we go back and look at the world's great herbal traditions, Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, Yunani Tib, Campo, Jammu, Tibetan medicine, physiomedicalism, eclectic medicine, herbs are almost always used in complex formulas, not as individual entities. You don't just take uh, rhodiola. You just don't take uh, echinacea. You take formulas because we're dealing with complex people with complex problems. And so usually when you take adaptogens, you know, may take one or a few, but you usually use them with other herbs like nervines, which are nerve tonics or nootropics, which are enhanced cognitive function, or what I would call restorative tonics to create something that is instead of think of it as music instead of a single note all right you then have a chord and then if you do it right you have a song and that's yeah. using herbs in formula yeah, that's beautiful. the song yeah yeah hey david the 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 uh but would you for someone who is now um inspired to uh, maybe not to study herbalism, although there are many people being inspired to study herbalism. We'll talk about that later. But just, hey, I, I, I want to bring uh, a gestalt, you know, a framework into my medicine cabinet, into my well-being. Would, would I, if I started with adaptogenics and I explored what the right intention is for me, you know, um, is that a good, a good anchor? You know, in other words, could I could I start with that and then look at nerve veins and look at or, or do you need to look at that whole framework from the from the beginning as a user? You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's a great question because you can use herbs symptomatically. So if somebody says to me, you know what, I have a stomach ache and I can say, here, take some ginger. And if it helps, fantastic. But if they come back tomorrow and the day after and the day after that with a stomach ache, then ginger obviously is not enough. So you can use herbs on kind of a first aid level, you know, in the sense yeah. of dealing with an acute situation. Um, you could take an adaptogen because you're just feeling really stressed out. But the challenge is, let's say you decide you hear rhodiola is really good. And so you decide you're really stressed out, you know, and you're going to take rhodiola. The challenge of rhodiola is it's one of the most stimulating adaptogens. And so if you are the person that if you eat a little square of chocolate after dinner, you can't sleep at night, you take uh -huh. rhodiola, 
you're not going to be able to sleep at night either. I see. You also don't want to take rhodiola if you have uh, if you have bipolar if you're bipolar because it can yep. precipitate a manic episode. Um, rhodiola is also extremely extremely drying. So if you have dry mouth, dry cough, dry eyes, dry skin, lack of synovial fluid in the joints, you you know when you move your joints, you sound like the uh, the the Tin Man in Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Uh, or vaginal dryness, or any, or or dry constipation, rhodiola is going to make it worse. So there are very mild um, herbs, possible adaptogens like a maca that anybody could take, but you need to take massive amounts of it to notice much of an effect. Um, and then beyond that, I think it always, you know, you would go to the pharmacy and just start picking stuff off the shelf and taking it. Right. So I think if you're going to use herbs, it it's a good idea to start educating yourself. You don't have to become an herbalist, but no. read some books, read about it, learn about tell, it. Uh, learn David, about tell it. us. Use them. Tell us. Yeah, yeah. David, um, tell us. Uh, I think the ingestion of herbs, adaptogenic and others, the form of ingestion. Mm -hmm whether in tincture or capsule or tea. Well, do you have a, and the fact that adaptogenics have an association with tonics, you know, um, could you talk a minute of whether you, you, you feel there's a preference from your point of view of how one begins to use herbs? Does it, does, ingestion is very often a stumbling block mm. for people who are starting out. What, what are your, thoughts about that well there are, there are there, there's no one answer to your question and why i say that is is that some of the adaptogenic herbs taste reasonably good so drinking them as a tea is is reasonable and remember you know if somebody doesn't like the way something tastes the chances of them continuing to use it are pro not very good um yeah. I like tinctures a lot, and a tincture for our listeners who may not be familiar with them is a alcohol and water extract. They're much more concentrated than a tea, um, so you don't need to take a lot of it. So even if it tastes bad, you're only taking a teaspoon, five mils, for instance, which is a you know a fairly normal sort of higher end dose. Um, you can quickly swallow something that tastes better and get the taste out of your mouth usually. Um, so I like tinctures. They're very quickly absorbed. The alcohol in the tincture actually allows you to bypass your digestive system. And so because of the alcohol, it's either absorbed sublingually under the tongue or it goes right through the gastric mucosa. Capsules and tablets are easy to take for most people, unless you're talking about a child who is not old enough to be able to swallow a pill. But depending on what's in the pill, it may or may not be a good form. So you, in a pill, you could have just ground up herb, which is generally not the best way to take most herbs, or you could have an extract in that capsule where it's already been extracted and concentrated. So the reality is, if you wanna know what's the best form of taking an herb, you have to ask two questions, for who and what herb? Okay. Meaning there are certain herbs that if you dry them, they lose almost all their activity. Not, not adaptogenic okay. herbs, but let's say an herb like um, uh, skullcap. Yeah. Skullcap is a nervine. It's a wonderful herb. But when you dry it, you lose, in my opinion, probably 70% of its activity. Mm. So if I want to use skullcap, I want to use a fresh tincture or a fresh glycerate. A glycerate is a glycerin extract. And I'm not a huge fan of glycerates um, because most herbs don't make very good glycerates, but a few do. And Skullcap actually makes a very nice glycerate. Um, and but so, what is the, the poor, the glycerate is the, is the sweetness? No. What what is the per? Could you define that glycerate? Because that's a well, very gl glycerate is an extract using glycerin in water. Okay. The problem is is that glycerins are very sweet, so there yeah. there's a lot of compliance for especially with children. But glycerin in actually inhibits absorption, whereas alcohol increases absorption. And glycerin is not a great extracting medium. So a lot of stuff doesn't get pulled out. So if you have an herb that most of the ingredients you want are water-soluble, glycerin works fine. But if you have a lot yeah. of things that are more alcohol-soluble, glycerin does not work well. 
and the tincture is is right. yeah is better you know it's interesting about the taste because um i certainly uh have found even for myself in progress progressing with my own um practice of taking herbal medicine that you it's an acquired taste it's not really a bad taste and that um you know when you when you drink medicine plant you know you if you can get primal enough and get connected enough to it 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 becomes a med it becomes uh an awakening to the body you know and 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 people people default very often because they don't like the taste of something because it's such a strong uh presence you know it's such a, st a strong uh influence over how we feel in our bodies but but I, I really encourage everyone that from my personal experience is that the, you know, the bitters and the, and the fermentation and the whole movement towards living pantry to try and, and have more digestive juice, you know, things, to, the, the taste does, does come, come to you. And, and, and there's a lot of good opportunities to experiment with improving taste, you know, um, but that's my thought. Um, the, the well, somebody is asking why what do you feel about licorice is that an adaptogenic herb okay so licorice is in the category of possible adaptogens so again well researched probable possible and so the possible not a lot of evidence so if licorice is an adaptogen and it's a big if it is an atypical adaptogen, meaning it's unlike any other adaptogen we have. All adaptogens lower uh, levels of the stress hormone cortisol. Licorice actually, especially in somebody who has too low cortisol, can actually increase cortisol levels. Licorice also has the ability to create what is called, it's a big word, this is a, a $20 word, it's called a pseudo-hyperaldosterogenic effect. What the heck does that mean? It wow. means it causes you to retain sodium and excrete potassium. And what that does is it makes your blood pressure go up and can cause cardiac arrhythmias. Um, that's not a common effect, um, but it can happen with licorice. So one of the things you need to understand about licorice is, number one, licorice should always be used as a very small part of a large formula. That's number one. Number two, if you have somebody who's hypertension, don't give them licorice. If you have somebody who's on blood pressure medication, probably not a good idea to give them licorice. Uh, and if you do take licorice, you, as I said, small part, large formula. And what I tell people to do is increase their intake of foods that contain a lot of potassium, whether we're talking about uh, dried apricots or tomato juice or and toma unsweet, unsalted tomato juice, because you don't want the sodium. Um, uh, bananas, I mean, lots of things have a lot of potassium. So increase potassium and decrease your sodium intake while you are taking the licorice, and it, it's fairly unlikely you'll have a problem. But I will say clinically that uh, women, uh, especially uh, women in research, absolutely have been shown to have this effect more than men. So just huh. be aware that that's a possibility. Interesting. Interesting. That's great. Um, you know, I'd like to, I'm going to go, while any guests, any attendees that want to share some questions around adaptogenic herbs, you can use the chat. We'll, we'll moderate. We'll start to feed from that and kind of weave that into the conversation in the, in the time remaining. A question that I, I've been wanting to ask David, um, uh, that maybe he could um, speak to, which is, you know, uh, there seems to be more and more interest, let's talk, say from the younger contemporary uh, attendees to these herbal workshops and classes around the relationship between astrology and cosmology and energy with plants and adaptogenic plants, you know, or, you know, do, you you talk to it actually very early about that uh, are plants conscious you know you, you know do plants they have a persona and we see that 
there is um, interest in the cosmology. You know, I'm using the term cosmology. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you've actually asked me several questions in one. <laughs> if you're Unpack talking about it. astrology, I can't comment because I am absolutely ignorant about astrology. So that's outside of my yeah. wheelhouse. So I'll leave that yeah. to people who know way more than I do. Um, okay. When you talk about energy, that's a different story because in all traditional systems of medicine, it depends on what you mean by energy, in all traditional systems of medicine, the way that we determine the, how, how a plant works in the human body is a system known as energetics. And so earlier I mentioned adaptogens. Some of them are stimulating, yeah. some are calming, some are heating, some are cooling, some are moistening, some are warming, uh, uh, drying. That's energetics. And so yeah. if you have a person that is, has a hot, dry um, symptoms or constitution, you would want to avoid using herbs that are heating and drying because they'll exacerbate the condition and make it worse. So for instance, I have an herb company, uh, Herbalist and Alchemist, and we have a series of five lung formulas. And when we first came out with them, people said, oh, nobody's going to understand how to use them because it's too complicated. Every other company has one lung formula, you know, lung, lung formula. Well, the problem is the lungs in Chinese medicine are called the tender organ. Why? Because they are most susceptible to external pernicious influences. Heat, dryness, cold, dampness, and in Chinese medicine, wind, spasm. And so if you have somebody with a lung condition and it is a hot, dry lung condition and you give them an herb like OSHA, which is hot and dry, you don't make them better you make them worse. And so the person comes back and says, oh my God, I feel terrible. And you always hear people saying, oh, don't worry. You're just eliminating. It's a healing crisis. No, it's not a healing crisis. Well, it might be it's a crisis, but it's not a healing crisis. And you're, you're not eliminating. You use the wrong thing. Uh, and a lot of people have right. this idea that herbs are natural. So therefore they're all safe. Well, yeah, yeah. belladonna is natural and henbane is natural. And, you know, but they're not safe. So the other thing is people have this idea if you use a little bit of an herb's good, more must be better. So my aunt, um, uh, her name was Edna Chikalili, and, and she, um, she had this system she created to, how, to sort of define how herbs affect people. And she said herbs fit into one of three categories. They're a food, a medicine, or a poison. And so the wow. food herbs are not just things that we think of as food like garlic and ginger and cinnamon. It also includes our mild, gentle herbs like hawthorn and peppermint and chamomile and linden flower and lemon balm. And these can be taken in significant quantities. They are very unlikely to cause adverse effects. Now, when I say significant quantities, I don't think most of our readers, anybody would sit down and eat an entire bowl of garlic. You know, you can overdo anything. There are cases of people drowning from drinking too much water. It's true, really. Yeah. But in, within reason, these herbs are safe. It doesn't mean you couldn't have an allergic response because you can be allergic to anything, yeah. any food, any drug, any herb. But barring that and some odd idiosyncratic response, these are safe herbs. Our, medicine, our medicines are stronger. They need to be used with greater knowledge, and you use them for a specific reason, for a specific period of time, and then you stop. So herbs like golden seal and black cohage and ma wang, ephedra, these are medicines. These aren't, you don't just take them every day because they're good for you. You only take them if you have a specific need for them. And then the last category are the poisons. And unless you're trained to use them, you leave them alone because they are potentially dangerous. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now we have a lot of questions coming through, so okay, I want to uh, put some some uh, effort to that. Uh, uh, this is from Lisa. My current focus is the lim lymphatic system. Herbal insight into this would be wonderful, especially topical. Well, hi, Lisa. Um, unfortunately. 
it's kind of a big question, but what I would say is um, if you want to enhance lymphatic circulation, your, your lymph system has no heart like your blood does to pump it. So the thing that moves the lymph is movement, exercise, the muscles contracting and relaxing. That's what moves lymph, especially things like calf muscles and thigh muscles. And um, so um, topically, or externally, the best thing for enhancing lymphatic circulation is alternating hot and cold hydrotherapy. So like hot and cold sitz baths or hot and cold applications enhance both circulation of blood, lymph, as well as in Chinese medicine, qi, the, the life energy, uh, the kinetic energy. Um, internally with lymphatic herbs, we could also kind of do what I just did with foods, medicines, and poisons and say that with lymphatic herbs, we have mild lymphatic herbs like calendula and cleavers and chickweed and self-heal. And then we have our moderate acting uh, lymphatic herbs like red root and Oregon grape root um, and things like that. And then we have our really strong lymphatic herbs like poke root, which you really, I, I really wouldn't encourage people to use herbs like poke root unless they've been trained to use them. Because while it probably won't kill you if you overdo it, uh, you'll probably wish you were dead because um, it can cause projectile <laughs> vomiting, projectile diarrhea, gastroenteritis, prostate, prostration. So it's not an herb to play with. So, so we have three categories of lymphatic herbs. And the, some of the other mild ones are things like red clover and burdock root, which are lovely and safe. That's great. Hey, uh, I have another uh, question from one of, you know, actually one of our teachers, Rochelle. Uh, she says, what, what do you credit for adaptogens popularity in recent years? And can we create the same enthusiasm for other category of herbs? Well, I don't think you're ever going to create the same um, uh, enthusiasm that you have for adaptogens with something like laxatives, although they are pretty popular, or uh, something like a uh, expectorant, which helps you expectorate mucus, because those are used for specific issues. You don't you know, nobody is going to take a laxative, hopefully, unless they, you know, they're constipated. Um, and you're not going to use an expectorant unless you have, you know, congestion in your lungs. So what, why the interest in adaptogens? Well, when I first wrote my book in 2007, they were just starting to become popular. And of course, the second edition, which came out this past year in 2019, um, they are way more popular. And why? First off, let me say, everybody doesn't need an adaptogen. But if you are stressed out, and I can't imagine any of you being stressed out at the moment, but if you are stressed out, <laughs> If you're stressed <laughs> out because you haven't been able to leave your house, if you're stressed <laughs> out because you are anxious, if you're stressed out because of financial concerns or work-related issues or you're in a relationship or you're not in a relationship or all the various reasons why you might be stressed out at this time, the political issue, you know, concerns in the country, uh, um, social justice. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to be stressed yeah. out. Besides your, life, besides your specifics of your life, um, then adaptogens, especially with things like nervines, can be incredibly useful. And so the beauty of adaptogens is mostly is, for, is that they're relatively non-toxic and they have broad ranging effects on the body, whereas most other categories of herbs, with the exception maybe nervines has a fairly broad range effect, uh, your nootropics do, those are the sort of herbs that enhance cerebral circulation. Cognitive, I think it's coming, that category. Anti-inflammatories. And then the category that I call restorative tonics, which are a lot of herbs that people think are adaptogens, but aren't. So that would be things like astragalus and goji berry and amla fruit and process romania. They're great herbs that have incredible activity. They're just not adaptogens. Great. Let me keep going here. By the way, David, just... Um, in the new edition of your book, is it, is it more content, new research? Just people are asking, uh, they're interested in, in the book. And 
could you just comment on what the update was was focused upon? Okay. Did that question come from Sandy Bushberg? Yes. Is that my Sandy Bushberg, my friend out in Oregon? Yes, maybe. It's from Sandy. Sandy, <laughs> hey, how are you doing? <laughs> anyway, so the the new edition of the book is um, is maybe forty percent larger than the old book. Um, it is about sixty five percent revised. It has ten plus years of additional research, all referenced. Um, it has additional herbs that weren't in the first book. Uh, it has color photos that weren't in the first book. So I would say the first book was a nice beginning. The second edition, which basically I'm the sole author of the second edition, um, is much, much expanded and uh, I think substantially um, Great. more useful. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Alex. What, what are your thoughts on CAVA? I've been using kava during the week instead of alcohol. You really do feel kava. Kava. What are your thoughts on kava as an adaptogen, traditional, and, and just generally? Okay, first off, kava is not an adaptogen at all in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> kava is an anxiolytic. It is a diuretic, a urinary analgesic, and an antispasmodic. So what does that mean? It's good for anxiety. So if you're experiencing a lot of anxiety, especially with muscle tension, so your muscles are tight and you wake up at night and you're grinding your teeth and you're having like, you know, spasmodic muscle twitching and things like that along with anxiety, kava can be very effective. It, you're definitely right. Kava is a medicine. It is not a tonic. It is not a food herb. Um, I'm honestly not a huge fan of kava. I do use it my, with my patients for people, again, who especially with anxiety with muscle tension or for people with urinary tract pain. So for people with conditions like interstitial cystitis um, or helping to pass kidney stones, kava works really use well. Although again, I don't use it as a simple. Um, the challenge with kava is for some people, it leaves them feeling hungover the next day. So some people, and not everybody, and, and Alex may not experience this at all, but some people have definitely, when they take kava the next day, they feel groggy. Um, and that's one of the reasons I tend to use it in specific circumstances. And again, even if I was going to use it on a regular basis, I'd mix it with other herbs to kind of moderate some of those effects, especially the, the, the sort of grogginess that is not uncommon. Great. Thank you so much. I have a question from Lauren. In the case where one has been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, is, is there guidance to how one would begin using adaptogenic herbs? All right. Lauren, that's a, a wonderful question. And what I would say to it is this. Autoimmune diseases are a little complicated. And as an herbalist, I don't treat diseases, I treat people. So I could have five people all diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. They're not five rheumatoid arthritis, they're five people. Some, you know, different genders, different ages, different underlying issues. So as an herbalist, we are looking at what's going on in this person and how can I most effectively help them. So uh, there's not one answer to how do I treat an autoimmune disease. Now, what I will say, though, is that some adaptogens, not all, some adaptogens have an effect and they work as what is known as an immune amphoteric. And an amphoteric helps to re-regulate the system. So therefore, an immune amphoteric is an herb that helps to re-regulate a disordered immune system. Wow. Most people think that autoimmune diseases are caused by a hyperactive immune system. That's not exactly correct. With most autoimmune disease, the exception is type 1 diabetes, but most autoimmune disease, you actually have a prematurely aged immune system and it has lost its normal self-regulatory capacity. So you have hypoimmune function, the immune system is no longer able to regulate itself. So you have certain aspects of the immune system now attacking the body 
what is known as self-antigen tissue in the body, uh, creating inflammation and tissue damage. So what I can say is that with treating autoimmune diseases, there are three categories of herbs that I almost always use for people with autoimmune disease. And uh, the other thing I need to say is you don't cure autoimmune diseases, but you can control them in many cases really well. So the first category of herbs we use are things like immune amphoterics. They re-regulate the immune system, whether it's hyperactive, hypoactive, or in the case of autoimmune disease, both. So some of our immune amphoterics include herbs like reishi mushroom um, and herbs like uh, Asian ginseng and American ginseng. It also includes uh, astragalus, which is not an adaptogen. Uh, it also includes herbs like shizandra and ashwagandha and cordyceps, which are adaptogens. So number one, we would choose one or more immune amphoterics, but which one will depend on the specifics of your case, which of course I don't know. Number two, we would want to use what I call immunoregulatory herbs. These are herbs that help to inhibit excessive immune response, but they're not immunosuppressive, and they in, uh, inhibit inflammation and help prevent deposition of what are called immune complexes. And this is the basically causes the tissue damage with autoimmune disease. And herbs that are immunoregulatory herbs include herbs like sarsaparilla, turmeric, go to cola, the Chinese herb chai hu, uh, another Chinese herb called huang chin or bicow skullcap, uh, uh, boswellia. These are all um, immunoregulatory herbs. And again, which specific immunoregulatory herbs would be appropriate for you? I can't say because I know nothing about you or your case. And then thirdly, the category of herbs I use are what are called alternatives, not alternatives, alternatives. And alternatives are herbs that enhance elimination of waste via the major eliminatory organs, usually at least two or three of them, without um, actually causing noticeable increase of elimination. So they're not laxatives, they're not diuretics or uh, diaphoretics, they enhance normal elimination. So they help the body to get rid of metabolic waste that are interfering with systemic. Uh, effective systemic function. So some of your alternative herbs, actually many of them are lymphatic herbs as well. So some of the herbs I mentioned before for lymphatics, red clover, burdock, cleavers, uh, but also things like dandelion root, Oregon grape root, these are alternatives. And so I'm almost always, for people with autoimmune diseases, using herbs from these three categories uh, to help create a protocol which is appropriate for the specific person who has a specific autoimmune disease and a specific constitution and symptom picture. When you right. use herbs to treat disease, they will work sometimes. When you use herbs to treat people, they work much more frequently. I think that's a great, I think that's a great takeaway, you know, for tonight. Um, that the herbalist really does try to look at, at the person you know, and that everything is individualized from dosage to form of ingestion and so on. If they're uh, a good herbalist, it is. Uh, would you give a few words about your school and, and you know, the type of studies that people could um, pursue under your stewardship and, you know, what, oh, what's I'll, going I'll on? I'll tell you what, okay, well, yeah. <laughs> I guess I was going to say we could leave that to the end, but um, basically, um, my, my school is a two-year clinical herbal training program. So for people who, it's not a beginner program. So for people who are beginners, I'd recommend doing something like Rosemary Gladstar's um, correspondence program, great introductory program. But for people who have basic knowledge about herbal medicine or they're already practitioners and want to add herbal medicine into what they do, or they want to step it up a notch. Uh, half of my students are medical professionals. They're MDs, NDs, acupuncturists, uh, veterinarians, chiropractors, et cetera. And the other half of my students are people who maybe have, you know, several, you know, years or sometimes decades of, of you know, interest in herbal medicine and want to become clinicians. 
and it's both live in class and live online. Although at the moment with COVID-19, we are pretty much all, <laughs> we're entirely online, but eventually we'll go back to having people both online and in class uh, at the same time. And the class meets once a week, uh, Tuesdays from five to 10. And um, it's um, <laughs> Sandy who is actually on, uh, on, the, on the talk tonight is one of my former students. So Sandy, if you wanna type something in for everybody to read, because I, I can only talk about it from my perspective as, as the teacher. I could, I, I, I know, I, I mean, not having uh, had the, the privilege to take the class, I, I do wanna say, that you know um i am i'm i get a tremendous amount of inquiries from from nurses uh phd doctorates psychiatry you know the whole gamut asking saying they want to find a course that can allow them to pivot into herbal practice you know to incorporate herbal practice or to layer that knowledge onto what they're already doing and uh i i think that uh david's class is is ideal for that would would sandy agree <laughs> well i don't know what sandy said but what i can say is my students i said about half of them are medical professionals chiropractors massage therapists as well but the other half are people who just are fascinated by herbal medicine and want to become, maybe they want to be a community herbalist helping friends, family, and neighbors. Maybe they want to be a clinical herbalist. Maybe they want to be an herbal educator. Maybe they're in academia. Maybe they're a researcher. Uh, maybe they want to start their own herbal products company. I, all of those kind of people become my students. But, but I think it would probably be good. Let's try to get to some other questions because we only have. We yes, no, I wanted to get that in because some people leave earlier. So that's good. We have a question. We have a question uh, on, do you have a view on local versus imported herbs? I do. <laughs> I have a view on a lot of things, but uh, unless it's something I know absolutely nothing about, like astrology, in which case I don't know a thing, but I, I do. And that is, while I love the idea of using local herbs, and so for instance, if I have uh, a patient and they're knowledgeable about plants and they grow some of their own herbs or they know what's growing in their backyard and I can you know, show them how to use those medicines that are free and they can make their own medicines and there's something special about making your own medicine, that is fantastic. But I don't believe in dogma. And so therefore, I am going to use the best herbs that I can for the person I am treating. So while I might prefer to use something that maybe is local if possible, if the herb that is right for them, so for instance, there's a Chinese herb called Tian Ma, Gastrodia. It is the single best thing for treating tinnitus that I have ever come across and nothing that grows here in the United States comes close. There are mm. things that you can use, like ground ivy, but it's nowhere near as effective as TMA. So you could sit there and say, well, you know, I don't want something that comes from far away. Well, my philosophy is I want what's gonna help my patient. And yeah. so do I prefer local? Uh, absolutely. Do I prefer organic or sustainably wild harvested? Absolutely. Um, and there's certain herbs I simply will not use because they're endangered or threatened species. So I just, I won't use them. I think to make plants extinct, uh, is, is a crime. So I, I won't do it. But if there is an herb available that's going to help somebody and it comes from some other part of the United States or some other continent and it's available and it's sustainable, and especially if it's organically cultivated, sure, I'll absolutely use it. The, the herb you uh, were just mentioning, uh, tinnitus? Tin uh, the tinnitus is the ringing in your ears. The herb's called tian ma, oh, no. T-I-A-N-M-A, or gastrodia. T-I-A-N-M-A, okay. We yeah, got gastrodia, G-A-S-T-R-O-D-I-A. -A. It's a Chinese herb. Yes. But it's okay. never used by itself. Again, it's always used as part of a complex formula. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay. You know, um, there is a question here of 
of just your point of view, you know, you and I talked, and maybe it'd be good for you to just talk a moment on this, which is um, in the in the in the realization of the of the COVID and COVID nineteen, people have had a tendency to really, you know, reach for all kinds of solutions, you know, and um, you and I had a good conversation about that in the heat of the uh, early stages in, back in March or April. But um, people are asking of what is your, what is your, just your point of view on this, on this, this situation we're in and for people that are interested in herbal medicine, we, what, what, what would you like, what would you uh, share with us about that? Well, we are dealing with a novel coronavirus something we have never seen before. So therefore, and you can't sit there and say, well, traditionally we use this. We've never dealt with this before. So there is no tradition. There is nothing to look back at. And so I saw initially a lot of herbalists were putting stuff out on the internet saying, well, this worked for SARS. Well, and they'd say, well, SARS is, you know, 82% um, uh, uh, genetically similar to COVID-19. Well, mice and humans are 85% genetically similar, but there's a whole lot of difference between a mouse and a human. So the fact that they have similarity does not mean what worked for SARS is going to work for COVID-19, although it's certainly a starting point. And then we saw a lot of people saying, well, this worked in the 1918 Spanish flu uh, epi uh, pandemic which is the last time we've had a really serious worldwide pandemic like this. Well, the problem is that was an influenza. This is not influenza. Um, and so the reality is much of what I saw being put out by the herbal community, I was rather distressed by, not to, it, it doesn't distress me to say, hey, this is what they did in 1918 for influenza. This is what they did for SARS. Maybe we want to try it. People were putting it out as, this will help you. That's mm. the problem. Yes. We yes. don't know. Now, there's a lot of information that's come out of China as to what was used in China um, for helping people who had COVID-19. The problem is all the early information, none of it is research studies. It's all just reports on what they were trying. And it's very difficult from that information to determine whether or not they actually were beneficial. We are just starting to get in the last month some retrospective studies out of China comparing people who had um, COVID-19 and were treated with herbs um, as well as orthodox medicine versus ones who were just treated with orthodox medicine. And there does seem to be some um, uh, increased benefit. But the challenge with Chinese herbs is that, again, they're using complex formulas and you have all these symptom patterns. So everybody with COVID-19 doesn't have the same symptoms. Uh, the mm. people I treated with COVID-19 um, basically um, ranged from moderate symptoms to one person who had relatively severe symptoms, although not severe enough that he wound up in the hospital. And the herbs seemed to help, but I think we have to be cautious because we simply don't have that much data. And so... If somebody asked me, what, are there herbs that I would try? The answer is absolutely yes. All right. So yes, there are herbs that I would try, but can I say with any certainty that they would work? The answer is no, I don't have that knowledge, nor does anybody else. There are some people in the herbal community who actually have treated quite a number of cases of COVID-19. And we know that herbs can be beneficial for certainly relieving some of the symptoms for sort of mild to moderate COVID-19. How effective they are for severe COVID-19 is a whole nother story. So in this sense, I tend to be rather conservative, meaning I don't want to make claim things that I cannot prove. And that to me was one of the issues. I think that's a big takeaway. That was one of the issues in... Um, 
uh, the herbal community is a lot of people were telling people, try this, try that. And it's okay to say, try this. I don't know if it'll work. It's a different thing to tell people, try this, it will work. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's a question um, uh, back to adaptogen, adaptogens. This, is, this may be our last question for the night, but what adaptogens are traditionally regarded safe to take for life? Is it beneficial to rotate these and other herbs we take when we look at it from a long-term uh, perspective? That you know, bringing it into one's regimen, I, I suppose. Um, is it okay to take uh, adaptogenic herbs uh, for life or rotate? What What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I even food. I don't eat the same food every day. I rotate what I eat. I have a varied diet and that's the healthiest diet. So I don't think anybody should be necessarily eating anything every single day or taking any specific herb necessarily every single day unless it is indicated and you need it. So I would say no one should probably be taking adaptogens every single day because uh, I don't know that you need one every single day. Um, and if you take adaptogens, you take the ones that are appropriate for you now. And let's say after a while, you might decide you don't need it, or you might decide it's not working for you anymore, and maybe you need to reevaluate and determine what's appropriate now. So give you an example. Um, one of the really mild adaptogens, but well-researched adaptogen, is an herb called eleuthero, the herb formerly known as Siberian ginseng. And eleuthero is very mild, not particularly stimulating, it's not nourishing, and I primarily use it for people who are 15 to 35. They have all of their vital energy. So they're not exhausted, depleted. You know, it's for somebody who's in college and they're pulling all-nighters for finals. So you might take it for a period of a couple of weeks during that time. It might be the person who's having to do a lot of traveling. I, I Like last year, now the year before, I flew back from Italy and was home for three days and then had to fly to the West Coast. I didn't know what time zone I was in. I mean, an adaptogen then is a really good thing. Now, of course, I'm older, so I, I wouldn't use a, a luthero, but you're using it for younger people when they have times of stress. Uh, you just graduated law school and passed your boards and you're working for a law firm and they're expecting you to work 70 hours a week. A week. Now, on the other hand, then, for instance, something like American ginseng, which, by the way, do not buy wild American ginseng. If somebody is selling wild American ginseng, it has been caught, harvested out of the wild. It is an endangered species. Do not support that. What you want is organically woods-grown ginseng. So it's grown in its natural habitat, but it's cultivated. That's what you want. So with American ginseng, I tend to use American ginseng for people who are aged maybe 40 to 60. And this is for that person that needs a nourishing adaptogen, slightly stimulating, but not very stimulating. Uh, maybe they have some dry cough. And this is the person who's starting to notice that they're a little more sensitive. Like if they stay up late, they really feel it the next day. Or jet lag takes longer to get over, or they're more temperature sensitive. They're starting to lose some of that vitality. My friend Russell used to say, when you're a teenager, you're immortal. In your 20s, you're a superhero. In your 30s, you become mortal. And at 40, the warranty wears off. And the first thing that goes is the eyes. Boy, he knew what he was talking about. So you're starting to notice, you know, you're just not as resilient as you used to be. And so there you might use something like American ginseng. Then we have white Asian ginseng, Chinese or Korean, and that's more for somebody who is 60 to 70, in that 55 to 70, and they've definitely lost more of their vital energy. They're tired, they're exhausted, um, they just don't have the strength they used to have. And then something like Asian red ginseng you would use for somebody who is more 70 and older. Uh, they're cold all the time. You go visit your grandparents in Florida, and it's in the summer in Florida, and it's incredibly hot. And you walk into their apartment, and it feels like their apartment's a sauna, and they're wearing a sweater, and they're still cold. Um, 
and they have, you know, no. That red, that's red ginseng? Red, red ginseng? Yeah, yeah. The red last thing, the last oh, thing, all these, all these young boys who are 16 years old with a scarlet T on their forehead for testosterone, the last thing they need is red ginseng. <laughs> okay. But that's an example. Now, there are a lot of other adaptogens that, you know, but that was sort of just an example of a line, that, a very easy way of saying, you know, different adaptogens are used at different times. So the adaptogens that you would use uh, when you're 15 or 20 would be different than what you're going to use when you're 45 or 50. Although those guidelines are just that guidelines. If I have a young woman with chronic fatigue syndrome, who the big event of the day is getting out of bed and going to the bathroom, grabbing something to eat and getting back into bed, and she's exhausted from that, I'm not going to use a Luthero because it's not nourishing. There I might use American ginseng, even though she's 25 years old, or even maybe yeah. Asian white ginseng, because she needs something much more stimulating and nourishing. You know, the thing that's great uh, that in, in what you're sharing, I, I think, is that, you know, an awful lot of people come to herbs out of crisis, you know, an illness, an, an issue that they haven't been able to get, you know, covered, or out of a pursuit of an alternative remedy from a pharmaceutical remedy, you know. But what we notice at the Alchemist Kitchen is a growing number of people, many of them younger, but all ages, that are would consider themselves relatively healthy and want to begin incorporating more herbs adaptogenics into their lifestyle you know so the education isn't oh well you know anymore like well what do i need herbs there's nothing wrong with me you know right. to a mindset of of health plant-based health and and i think we're seeing a, a, a potential for a great groundswell but people need their ways into, into bringing it into their lifestyle, I think. And we need well, to encourage that. I agree. Let me, let me finish uh, with this one thing I want to say. And just sure. to understand, herbs are incredible. Um, I, in, in my practice, I use herbs all the time. I'm an herbalist. Uh, I use supplements as well, and they can be very useful, although I prefer herbal medicine, actually. But understand that nobody ever got ill because of an herb deficiency. Nobody ever got sick because they had a St. John's wort deficiency, for example. So herbs are not foundational. Herbs are an incredible therapeutic tool. What is foundational? And when talk, getting to what you're saying, Lou, what is foundational, number one, is diet. So eating, you know, somebody wants to maintain their health, eat healthy. And of course, lots of people get into fad diets. Most of those are not sustainable or not exactly uh, necessarily good for you forever. So a varied diet, a whole foods diet, uh, and I don't have time to go into all of my dietary stuff, but focus in on diet, sleep. Sleep is foundational, not just the number of hours, but the quality of sleep. The question I always ask my patients is when I say to them, how many hours a night sleep you get? Oh, I get seven, I get eight, I get nine, I get five, whatever they say. The next question is, when you wake up in the morning, do you feel refreshed? If they say no, no matter how many hours they say they're sleeping, there's something going on there. If you don't get good quality sleep, you're not going to be healthy. Exercise, healthy lifestyle choices. You know, what herb's good if I smoke cigarettes? Uh, no herb is going to necessarily protect you from the dangers of smoking a cigarette. Um, healthy relationships. Um, these are the foundations of life. And so those are the things you initially focus on and then start adding in. When we talk about diet, though, it also includes all these wonderful food herbs that can be part of your diet in the form of beverage teas, whether it's a hawthorn or uh, turmeric in your, uh, in, in your salad dressing, uh, whether it's parsley, which, you know, I always found it funny that people, they put parsley sprigs on the plate in restaurants and most people leave the parsley. It's probably the most nutritious thing on your plate. Uh, whether it's adding well, in wild foods like cooked nettles or dandelion greens. These are the, these are the foundational things. Yeah, that's great. That's terrific. Well, you know, on that note, 
we, we, maybe we'll have you back sometime in the future to talk about diet. That would be great. Always but I think, uh, I think uh, so would, on behalf of everybody that's attended um, and our staff and, and everybody, we're so grateful for your uh, influence. And we, it's a blessing to have uh, the chance to have some time with you tonight. Well, thank you. It's been absolute pleasure. And listen, I don't know if you can get a screen, uh, a screenshot of the questions that didn't get answered, but if you can capture the questions that didn't get answered and email them to me, um, I can try. I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't type very much. I'm dyslexic. Uh, so Rashad I, did, uh, I did a pretty, I did, I did a pretty good job, but I do think that if anyone has a specific question, please send it to Roshina. Roshina will, will in, be the intermediary and yeah, try to get your great. answers, you know, uh, because it, this is time, um, of, of, I say gratitude and kindness. That's how I start each day after you've had a good night's sleep, you know? And uh, thanks again. And really so appreciate, appreciative to all the attendees. This is very important for the Alchemist Kitchen and our desire to expand and extend our community. Thanks so much. Roshini, are you good? Um, I'm good. I just want to let everybody know that I just copied and pasted all the questions. So I'll send it to David. And then we always do a follow up email. So um, David can answer what he can, you know, with respect to his time and his energy. And then that will be in the email. So that will be great. And then the recording will go out tomorrow. So just stay tuned. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. That was stay great. Well, thank you so much. And enjoy your summer. Thank you. Thank you.